If you, if you have your Bibles, uh, you will want to open uh, with me to Isaiah chapter 11. If you've been with us for very long, you know that I have a sort of preferred, preferred method uh, for preaching. I like to take a passage, uh, explore it, talk about it, and ultimately uh, leave us with some thoughts on how we might respond to it. And, and each week, uh, that passage uh, comes uh, within a larger scope of scripture, and so we're moving usually through a book of the Bible chronologically from beginning to end. But all that changes this morning, just for today. Because today is a special day, as you heard uh, Carrie reference a few moments ago. Uh, some talk about it as the birthday of the church. Uh, in some places, people even throw parties, uh, huge parties today, Pentecost. <laughs> I told Jane that I really wanted to do this, but then she said, you shouldn't. So I'm going to, uh, because that's, you know, a recipe for, there's this ridiculous song uh, in the King James every time re references the Holy Spirit, uh, speaks of the Holy Ghost. And there's a song and an accompanying video on YouTube that goes something along the lines of, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. So that's the party that's happening right now, and you should go find that video. And in... <laughs> okay, what she actually told me was that I shouldn't actually do the dance that I was doing with it. So, <laughs> um, in the Christian marking of time, <laughs> it is. Pentecost is rivaled in importance only by the events of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Pentecost, seven weeks after the resurrection of Jesus, marks the day when Jesus sent his Holy Spirit like a mighty rushing wind so that it rested on his disciples. And the book of Acts in the New Testament tells this story. This community of Jesus followers then devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching about Jesus and the kingdom of God. They devoted themselves to sharing their uh, financial resources with each other, to sharing life and meals together, and to gathering together uh, for prayer and for worship. They devoted themselves to each other for the sake of what God wanted to do through them. This is why many have called Pentecost the birth of the church. With Jesus absent from the world, the followers of Jesus had been given his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, and so they were enabled to carry on the work that Jesus began that we read about in the Gospels. The people that joined this movement then were people who, who were ready to suffer the same fate as Jesus. Because for the very first time in their lives, they, they knew what God was doing in the world. They finally understood why they existed and, and they had been given the ability to begin to live that out. They had been born to new life. It's commonly accepted that the Holy Spirit is what marks the birth of this community called church. It is also widely accepted that when you get two people together to talk about who or what the Holy Spirit is, you are guaranteed to get at least three different opinions. Part of the reason for this is that there is no one verse. No one passage or even one book of the Bible that is dedicated to saying clearly and definitively, this is the Holy Spirit and this is what the Holy Spirit does. And, and so this is why I thought it might be helpful this morning to take a break from our, our walk through Isaiah chronologically to sort of jump into a hot air balloon and, and look at Isaiah with a big picture because Isaiah is really influential in the way that New Testament authors, Jesus himself, come to talk about the Spirit of God. And so I'm curious, what does Isaiah have to say about God's spirit? So to do this, I picked three passages from Isaiah to look at. Uh, I picked these three because they come from three different sections in the book, dealing with three different times in Israel's life. And I also picked these three because they deal with, with different people who are said to have God's spirit upon them. 
And as we look at each of these passages, passages that we already heard Laura and Jane and Rebecca read for us, I want you to have in the back of your mind Jesus and the church and us. What did Jesus do after the Spirit of God came upon him? What did the church do after the Spirit came upon her and us? We confess to be people with God's Spirit. And so what are the implications of these passages for those of us who claim to have the Spirit of the living God? So uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah has spent 10 chapters in the book, in this book, detailing Judah's rebellious refusal to trust their God. God has given them promises and God has given them signs to confirm these promises, and yet they still cannot trust. Maybe this, you feel like you resonate with, with this. At the end of, of chapter 10, then, Isaiah offers a graphic image of God's people, of Judah, as this vibrant forest being chopped down so that all that remains is a single stump. But verse 1 picks up. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And so destruction is not the final word. From the appearance of complete destruction, new life will emerge. Beauty will rise from the ashes. And this comes in the form of a person. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And we have no idea in Isaiah who this him is yet, except that him is the shoot from the stump of Jesse. And so perhaps it's a king in the line of David, the son of Jesse. But we keep reading about the spirit that rests upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And we might notice some things about this list. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. These are all characteristics that we associate with the mind. Who we look at to teach us. What we know. How we make sense of what we know. And how we determine what to do in response to our understanding of what we know. Counsel, knowledge, understanding, wisdom. This is the prime activity of the Spirit of the Lord. But it's easy to bring our own sort of ideas uh, about the mind into this passage. One of the ways this happens is regarding wisdom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon this figure, and so the spirit is the spirit of wisdom. Therefore, wisdom is something the spirit just gives you like this, like snap of your fingers and now you're wise. Or light bulb, I have an idea. Therefore, because I have the spirit, it must be from the Holy Spirit. The problem with this is that the gospel of Luke describes Jesus as one who has the spirit of the Lord and who grew in wisdom. And so it seems fair to me that if Jesus had to grow in wisdom, so should we, or so do we. And so Isaiah introduces us to the, the possibility that there are actually different kinds of wisdom and understanding, that there are actually different kinds of counselors that we could turn to, that there are even different kinds of might that we could trust in and knowledge that we can lean on and things to fear in our world. So when Isaiah speaks of the spirit of wisdom and understanding, Isaiah is describing the wisdom and understanding that come from the Lord, which is entirely different from the wisdom and understanding that come from Judah's leaders or the rulers of surrounding nations. But... This is where it gets a little bit messy for us because the wisdom and understanding of Judah's leaders often comes in the name of Israel's God and it often sounds pretty spiritual and often just as spiritual, if not more spiritual than the wisdom of God's prophets who speak God's actual word. So here, here's what I mean by this. As the story picks up in Isaiah, Judah has enemies to the north, we'll call them Canada, are threatening the capital city of Washington, D.C., right? Super scared. Um, they're Mounties and whatnot. Um, but Isaiah says, don't worry. Your enemies will not defeat you. You can trust this, not because they're Mounties, but because God has said so. 
At the same time that Isaiah is saying this, Judah's rulers, along with other prophets, are saying, don't worry. Your enemies will not defeat you. Same message, right? But they say, you can trust this because God would never allow his holy city to be destroyed. Can you see the dilemma the people have? Both voices are saying, don't worry. They are, but they are both offering different reasons for not worrying. And we go one step further because Isaiah tells the people, so the truth is you've been unfaithful to God. And you don't have to worry as long as you repent. They are in danger because of their unfaithfulness. And God right now is inviting them to return to him. Well, Judah's rulers have a different understanding of why things are happening. Judah is under attack because Canadians are evil. But God will defeat his enemies. This is why Judah doesn't have to worry. They just need to keep believing that God will rescue them. Can you hear the difference? Distinguishing between these two realities is a skill that the Bible calls discernment. Discernment isn't always about figuring out between good and blatantly evil. Sometimes it's as subtle as figuring out the difference between true and almost true. We can see how the wisdom of these two paths of understanding play themselves out. The rulers of Judah, who are almost true, and their prophets have a shaky trust on a shaky foundation. They trust God, but not what God has actually said. They trust what they hope God will do for them. And so they do not have a spirit that seeks the Lord's counsel. Instead, they have a spirit that turns to military strategy or to what works. And so they trust not in the Lord's might, but they turn to Assyria and Assyria's might. They have a spirit of fear, but it's not a fear of the Lord, it's a fear of their enemies. And the path of the one who has the spirit of the Lord is distinctively different from that path. Isaiah tells us about that path as he continues in verse 3, where he, where he says, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Now, in other words, he will not allow his experience to dictate what is true or what he will do. What his eyes see and what his ears hear will not be trusted as the source of his truth. Instead, those have to be evaluated and understood according to the standard of God's word. So that, with righteousness, we continue to read, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The scriptures suggest that on our own, nobody has an interest in doing what is right for the poor, for doing what is fair for the weak on the earth. That is, unless they have come into contact with God, God's plans and God's purposes, which sometimes has happened to us unknowingly. So let me summarize uh, so the, the idea that being that this doesn't come natural, that it is learned, and that it keeps growing, and so that the generous become more generous as they possess or come into contact with God's Holy Spirit. And so let me summarize then the wisdom of the second path. The one with the Spirit trusts the Lord. And because he trusts God, he doesn't fear the enemy outside. Instead, he seeks God's counsel. And in seeking God's counsel, he knows what God has said. And then he understands what is required of him. And he does then what is wise, justice and righteousness. The one with the spirit knows that Jerusalem on its own is a worthless city. If that city fails to be the light to the world that God intended it to be. And so the one on whom the spirit uh, rests, seeks God and seeks to transform the city, not merely secure it. Can you hear the difference between these two paths? Right? The rulers of Judah are not interested in changing their city. A lack of justice is actually a really good thing for them. And so instead, they want survival both for their city and for the status quo, which they find beneficial. And they do not want to change or grow. And they do not want their prophets to come along saying, change or grow. 
I, I happened to read an article uh, this, just this week uh, in Forbes magazine. It was online. It was by a guy who spend, has spent his career helping businesses and organizations develop leaders. In the article, he describes the results of a survey taken by 50,000 leaders. People were supposed to rank 16 different leadership skills on a scale of importance. Like, which one do you think is most important for leaders to have in an organization? And he said in this article that at every, at every level of organizational leadership, leaders consistently list self-development as dead last on the list of things that good leaders should be doing. In other words, learning, growing, developing skills, getting better, none of this matters to leaders as long as a business can move forward, can grow and keep expanding. But this is where the, the article got super interesting. The author then said that in analyzing and observing the leaders best able and least able to develop themselves, he found these consistent themes among those who were the worst at self-development. He said, one, they don't know how to listen. Two, they aren't open to the ideas of others. Three, they aren't honest with themselves. Four, they don't take the time to develop others. And five, they don't take initiative. Yet, they don't care. <laughs> as long as their businesses are growing and making money. And, and so I, I laughed my way through this, this article thinking about these passages I was reading because it was as if the author had just looked at the people of Judah and Isaiah and just described them. Isaiah constantly criticizes them for being unable to hear his messages. He criticizes them because when they do hear it, when they do listen long enough that it looks like they're paying attention, they go, eh. they just disregard it entirely. They reject it. He mocks them for their, uh, their unawareness of their unfaithfulness. He pushes them to be concerned for others, reminding them how self-interested they are. And he challenges them on their lack of a desire to turn back to God. They don't care as long as they remain safe and hold on to power. And this is a consistent spirit among God's people, right? We've seen it in Israel. We've seen it in Jesus' disciples as we've spent time this year in the Gospel of uh, Matthew. We've seen it through the history of the church. I want Jerusalem to be safe and secure, the people of Judah say. I want Jesus to establish his kingdom in Israel. His disciples say, I want the church to grow, we say, but, and it's a huge but, I don't want to change. I don't want to grow. I don't want to learn. I don't want to develop as a person. This is a refrain that echoes through the halls of history. We want our circumstances to get better, but we don't want to become better, at least not if it's going to take significant work or effort. And at every point, God's people have heard God calling out, repent, turn toward God, take on his spirit, be transformed by God, and stop worrying about the outcomes. We spent quite a bit of time looking at chapter 11, but I also want to look at both 42 and 61. And, and like I said, these are by no means the only passages that give us insight into God's, uh, into the work of God's spirit, but they're, they're an important foundation for us. So chapter 42 opens. Verse one, saying, behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it hard or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till, his established, till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. 
Just before this, uh, Isaiah has described the servant as Israel. And then we hear this, Behold my servant, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. Chapters 40 and 41 go back and forth playing off of the words spirit and justice. Because here, Isaiah wants to bring them together with his description of the servant's work. Bring forth justice to the nations. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He has established justice in the earth. This is what the servant has been chosen for. Most of Israel's history is spent misunderstanding their chosenness. They imagine that they, have some, that they have God's special favor in a way that the nations do not, but they have been mistaken over and over again. God has chosen them, and he has given them work to do, but not for their own sake, but for the sake of the world. The spirit that God gives to them is a spirit that is supposed to transform their fears. It's supposed to transform their knowledge and understanding and their wisdom. It's supposed to transform the direction of their trust, all for the purpose of making these people capable of being God's servant to the world. God has not given his, his, uh, his people his spirit so that they can sit and be comforted in their unfaithfulness and their disregard for their neighbors. Chapter 61 then continues by giving us a different voice. Isaiah tells a story of the servant who refuses to embrace its calling. And so there is one who accepts the call to be God's servant. And we hear it. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress of ashes. Again, we're confronted by the spirit being given for a purpose for a task, for a vocation, for a job. Those who are given the spirit are to be at work with the Lord to accomplish his purposes in the world. Last week in the middle of my message, I said, so let me tell you what this looks like. And I want to do the same thing this week. There was a church that had been trying to figure out why it existed and what it should be doing. And in those discussions, someone came with an idea. There's a, an organization called World Vision, and it's an international Christian relief uh, organization. And they, have, they provide some resources for churches that are interested in sort of observing a special day. And they call that day Be the Church Sunday. And a church doesn't, f for that Sunday, the ch a church cancels all of its normal Sunday morning stuff, and instead it plans service opportunities uh, in the community and around the church. And so the church planned Be the Church Sunday for Pentecost, fitting. The service uh, opportunities were dreamed up by different members of the church and then they were planned. And, then, and some that day went to nursing homes uh, to be with, to sit with, to care for uh, those who are a pretty large group uh, in our community that, that, are, that are actively marginalized and forgotten about. Uh, others went and did yard work for some older couples that were desperately in need of it. Some picked up garbage, and one group decided to do a, a, a mobile barbecue of sorts uh, for the homeless in Livermore. That mobile barbecue became a, a weekly meal that we still host every single week, and that's supported almost entirely, and has been since 2008 maybe, uh, entirely through personal contributions and volunteer hours of the people that you are sharing seats with and rows with. Over time, it's changed in a variety of ways. It, it's no longer just a meal for people who are homeless, uh, but it often serves a range of needs. Sometimes for people who are transitionally unemployed uh, have benefited from it. Sometimes people who are on fixed incomes have found it helpful. Um, there are a variety of ways in which this has been a blessing. Uh, in people's lives, and they have uh, experienced the love and compassion of Christ uh, through many of you. 
Last week I painted a picture of a church that for a number of years was marked by some unfaithfulness. But unfaithfulness is never the whole story for God's people. There were things that we were not doing for sure, but there were also things that we were doing to honor God and that should be celebrated as an expression of God's spirit alive in us and through us. And it's funny because I remember some of the early conversations about the breakfast. Was this really what we were going to emphasize together? Were we really going to invest so much of our, our lives and our volunteer hours in, in this ministry? And if you remember what I said last week, we were in a season of serious financial uh, crisis, you could say. We were pretty freaked out. Uh, and so developing relationships with people who don't have, to get, don't have much to give you financially is kind of a terrible strategy for fixing your financial uh, problems, right? And yet, I remember conversation after conversation being so encouraged by people's hearts as they would say things like, we're not doing this to fix our financial problems. We're doing this because this is who God has called us to be. This is what it means to be Christian, to bear the name of Jesus. How did this group of people know that this is something that we should be doing? Because in Isaiah, we see that God's servant, whom the Spirit has come upon, does these sorts of things and calls his community to do these sorts of things. We know that this is the, the kind of thing that we ought to be doing because when Jesus stands up and says things like, I am the servant who has been anointed with God's Spirit, these are the very kinds of things that he then did. And when the church is born in the book of Acts and the spirit rests upon it, these are the kinds of things that the church did. So remembering back to Isaiah 11, we're reminded that there are two voices. One voice will tell us that, that we have to save God's church, whether it's a local congregation or, and maybe you hear this voice uh, enough sort of culturally, we have to save the American church fill in the blank, right? But that voice tells us we have to save God's church and we'll get busy with our strategies. But there's another voice, the voice of the spirit of the Lord that says, be transformed and be who I've called you to be and do what I've called you to do. And so do we have the spirit of God in us? How open are we to being transformed, to learning and growing? And how fully are our lives being given over in service for God's kingdom? To respond to passages like this, it's important for us to come to the table. It's important for us to take the bread and to drink the cup because there is a danger here. There is a danger that we might imagine that in this moment, we might muscle it up within ourselves to do what God has called us to do. But we are incapable. This is what Israel proved over and over again. And this is why God took on flesh and came and lived uh, amidst his people to show them what it looks like to live by the spirit, with the spirit, filled with the spirit, that this kind of life is possible but only as we abide in God himself and allow him to live and move and have his way through us.